Hey, good morning again, everybody. Um, as I said earlier, thank you uh, for zooming in on being with us on this Sunday morning. I'm videoing this on Friday morning, actually. Um, and uh, just want to say thank you to Gabrielle and Joe and, and Reed for the beautiful music. And begin by asking a question. If I were to say... Uh, Lions and tigers and bears, oh my, what would you think of? Where would that have come from? Ah, uh, you got it. It was an easy one, right? Wizard of Oz. Well, how about if I say uh, politics and religion and money, oh my, what do you think of? Oh, that's the thing we don't want to talk about with our family at Thanksgiving, right? Especially in these days, perhaps. Uh, but of course, where does that come from? Well, that comes from the sacred scriptures. And that is uh, a text uh, theme that we're going to deal with this morning. I've been brought to this text uh, through different layers this week, actually. And, uh, of course, we are only a couple weeks out from our election with the uh, Supreme Court hearings this week for uh, 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 the, the candidate that was brought forth. Um, and so we are surrounded and engulfed in politics. Uh, we are living in a time of great division, distrust, uh, the age of rage, I've heard it called, the cancer culture, I've heard it called. And uh, the reality is that, that life is complex and difficult for all of us in the midst, not only of a normal political election year, but also, of course, given the COVID realities, the restrictions, uh, the economics around all of this, the uncertainty, um, the inconsistency of how uh, we as a people are treating it. And so this text was brought to me uh, again through questions and through my own thinking and, and the reflection on the, the events of this week. Um, and what I'd like to do with you this morning is uh, engage the actual text, but uh, like all texts, there's always context. And um, I'm going to be reading out of uh, chapter 22 of Matthew just verses 15 through 21 or 22. But I want to give you the, the context first is that in, in Matthew 21 is, is the uh, Palm Sunday narrative of Jesus entering the city uh, peacefully and nonviolently, theater, street theater, um, contrast with the imperial forces of, of, of Herod uh, and coming in from the other side. Uh, it is the context of Passover, which is the when when pilgrims would come to Jerusalem and fill its streets, uh, remembering the ancestors who were liberated from the overlord called Egypt at the time, the Pharaoh who enslaved the people, God's miraculous deliverance. Uh, that is the context in uh, in the beginning of chapter 22. There is also a parable about a wicked king, often. Uh, terribly misinterpreted as representing God. And then at the end of chapter 22 is another narrative about Jesus uh, asking, is the Messiah the son of, uh, of David, a, a king, the king held in great uh, affirmation by the people? And of course, Jesus says, no, the Messiah is not the son of the king of David uh, or King David. Um, in fact, uh, the Messiah is Lord of David. And so politics is all over this text, all around it. And, um, and uh, so let me read to you now the text that we will engage this morning. Famous text, um, a text for our time, it was, as it was in Jesus's time, of course. And uh, Matthew 22, verses 15. Uh, to 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of God, of integrity, and that you teach the way of truth uh, in accordance with truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They bought 
brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. At the end of chapter 21, they had conspired to get him arrested. And that is kind of uh, the backdrop to the nature of the trap. It's a real trap. Um, and what's interesting is that you have two comp kind of competing ideologies or groups of people who are coming together to entrap Jesus, the Herodians and the, uh, the Pharisees. The Herodians are politicians and the followers of the political powers, Herod and such, that have been appointed by Rome. And uh, Herod was a puppet king, uh, a representative of Imperial Rome. And of course, the Pharisees are uh, the representatives of, of the religious uh, teachers of the law, uh, deeply associated with the temple. And uh, Jesus has just had his clash with them. And so it'd be these two groups coming together to get Jesus. It'd be kind of like, you know, the Vikings and the Bears coming together to try to beat the Packers, unfortunately. And, um, uh, or some other groups that might come to your mind. But it was a real trap because if Jesus says, yes, give the tax uh, to Caesar, well, then likelihood is that they believe that he's going to lose the crowds. And Matthew 21 makes it clear that the crowds are behind Jesus. The whole Palm story is about the crowds being behind Jesus. And the context, again, remember, is Passover, the crowds remembering liberation. And if he says to give to Caesar, you know, pay, pay the oppressor for oppressing you, chances are uh, there he's going to lose the following. And then of course, if he says, do not give the tax, then the Herodians kind of win and he can be handed over for uh, sedition and for uh, being a rebel against uh, the presence of Roman authority. So it's a real trap. And I think of these traps, you know, I, you know it's fall in Minnesota right now. And as a, it's, 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 um, it's Friday morning as I'm, I'm recording this and it's kind of sleeting, heavily rain, snow, and this time of year is when the mice try to get in the house, right? I don't know about your house, but they certainly try to get into ours, and and uh, I have my little trap set, and those teeth, they're on those little traps, and they crush the mouse, and I, I, know, I know it's not a lovely picture to think about, but some things, I guess, are just necessary, and uh, so this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to crush Jesus in, in the teeth of, of, of the trap. Now, in uh, verse 16, there's an interesting uh, kind of a core truth here. And we're going to talk about core truths this morning because this, this text is full of them. Uh, the, the leaders, these religious leaders say to Jesus, you, you know, you, you speak for God, you, you, you speak for God because it appears to us that you do not uh, judge by externals. And that's what it means. In English, it's a little bit more difficult to pick out there. Verse 16, uh, you do not judge by the externals, Jesus. So tell us the truth. And, and so that, that's kind of a challenging thing, isn't it? Uh, that Jesus uh, sees beyond the externals to the heart of a man or a woman or a child sees their interior life, sees the motivation behind their lives, the values behind their lives. And as, uh, as his followers, right? I mean, that's part of, of the maturing process in our own lives. To look beyond differences, to look beyond externals, and to look beyond that which divides and find within us the common interior lives of who we are. And that's gonna be flushed out in just a second here. Um, and that's why it's so interesting that after Jesus is in, in, in verse 17, he, he 
he, he is asked, should he pay the imperial tax? And again, as I mentioned, uh, should we pay the oppressor for oppressing us is basically what it is. And, and, and Jesus answers with this flip of the coin, as it were, and he says, you hypocrites. You actors with masks. You two-faced, is what he's saying. You present yourselves with one face, but inside you're somebody very different. And that's what a hypocrite means. In antiquity, it was an actor who wore a mask on stage to conceal their identity, to take on some other persona. They're actors. And that's what Jesus levies as his accusation against the religious and political class of his time. Um, in verse 20, he asked the question, whose image is on the coin? And um, one of the things that brought me to this text this week is that word image. And I was asked some questions by a young person and um, uh, and I thought of this word and, and it's in this text uh, uh, today, of course. And image is the same word that is used in in uh, the Genesis narrative. And it uh, it talks about man and woman being created or imprinted by or with the image of the divine, of the divine creator, of the sacred creator. And uh, God, that we bear the image of God. And uh, in, in uh, Gabriella's song entitled, You Say, um, here are some of the lyrics, if you didn't quite pick them up. Remind me once again, just who I am, because I need to know. Remind me once again, just who I am, because I need to know. In you, I find my worth. In you, I find my dignity my identity to bear the image of god according to the book of genesis core truth here to bear the image of god simply and significantly means this it says that we are sons and daughters of the one most high image is simply the declaration of sonship, the daughtership of God. Remind me again who I am. I am son. You are daughter of the one most high. And uh, so in verse 21, uh, Jesus says, well, if Caesar's image is on the coin, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Now, in antiquity, in, in the Middle East, in Judaism, contemporary as well, there is no separation. Theologically, spirit, there's no separation between the realm of Caesar and the realm of God. There's no, I'm a Christian on Sunday and, and I'm an American on, on uh, you know, Monday through Saturday. There's no separation. We are Christians in America. Um, and... Uh, the question is, uh, what and who belongs to whom? What belongs to whom? It's a profound question, right? Not an easy answer, but a profound question. How does faith, how does discipleship influence and affect how I live economically? What do I render to Caesar and what do I render to God? And here I will confess a sin to you. Randy and I, of course, are the owners of the pub. Randy's the official owner of the pub. I'm I'm the janitor as like I am. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, these are scary times for many people in the hospitality industry. Restaurants are hurting, closing, 
Uh, we're concerned about the winter coming, uh, the lack of people being able to be inside, numbers, can you make it economic, all those questions, right? And there, there's nothing unique or we're not alone in any of this. Um, and my confession is that there's a car parked in front of the pub, just a few spaces uh, from the corner. And I was told uh, by some neighbors across the street that it's a homeless man who is living in the van. And uh, my confession is that my first reaction was, well, I need to get him to move his van because he's impacting a parking space which impacts the potential of economics and economics rival for the pub. It's a disheartening and sad first reaction, but I confess to you that it's true. And then last night, the Thursday night, our elders meet, and I thank you elders for being uh, a team of those committed to uh, helping shape the future of our church. I we were going through our values, and I and it kind of hit me as I remembered my first reaction. And uh, I frankly was ashamed that my first reaction was not, "Wow, I got I have to invite this young man into the pub or into the church. I have to get to know his name." Uh, his story a little bit and find out if there is any practical way in which I or we can help him uh, winter is coming and living in a van is not really a is not really a humane option um, studies have shown that the more money we have the more danger there is in us becoming less empathetic with fellow brothers and sisters. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Render unto God what is God's. Here's a quote from New Testament, recently deceased New Testament scholar, uh, theologian Marcus Borg. Render under Caesar. Hmm. He says, what if Caesar is Hitler? Or apartheid? Or communism? Or global capitalism? What is it? What is to be the attitude of the Christian towards systems of domination? whether ancient or modern. Not easy stuff. I want to talk just a second uh, about one of the great dangers of our time. It's, it's nothing new. Um, but it's something that I have always felt kind of cut at cut at us somehow, dangerous, deceptive, um, and that is what might be referred to as civil religion, especially in the United States. I, I can't speak for other places in the world, I have no idea. But civil religion is like, like true faith has symbols that are sacred. And in civil religion in the United States, the sacred symbols, much like the fig tree was the sacred symbol of the temple, then Jesus cursed the fig tree. The, 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 the sacred symbols of civil religion in our time in the United States are what? What do you think of? Can you think of flag? If you do not stand for the national anthem another sacred symbol you are somehow desecrating the sacred symbol of the flag the bible itself the exterior right the the, the book not 
not the inside, not not the meaning, not the not the poetry, not the spiritual truths, but the book itself somehow held as a prop, a sacred symbol to civil religious followers. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, render unto God the things that are God's. Money imprinted on our currency is the phrase, in God we trust. Civil religion. And in civil religion, the president of the United States is the high priest. This is dangerous stuff that is used to divide people, to unite some falsely and to divide others who do not follow. Um, and that, of course, is the beauty of Jesus's response here and how he gets out of the trap. Render unto God what is God's and what is God's. And as soon as Jesus said it, they knew they had been defeated. These are folks steeped in the theology in the antiquity and in the history of the people. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. You belong to the Lord and all that you have. I belong to the Lord and all I have. The blue jay in the feeder belongs to the Lord. The leaf that I watch float down into the river The squirrel with the nut preparing for winter my dog laying by the fire to stay warm. All of it. All of it belongs to God. <clears throat> so, some core truths to take with us, to wrestle with. And we need to wrestle with this together. Number one, because one of the core truths in this text and this narrative, the leading up to this about the parable of the wicked king, the, 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 the destruction of the temple, the being arrested and executed by politicians for state crimes, all of this, all of this is not easy. And therefore, we need to wrestle and to stick together. Democrat, Republican, Independent, we belong to the Lord. And all of it is his. Number two, economics can either be used as an expression of divine compassion and inclusion and hospitality and justice or economics can make us less empathetic. Number three, there is no separation between the sacred and the secular. There's no spheres that are two. There's only one sphere, life. Number four, and I end with this. 
Remind me again who I am. Stamped. Image. Son. Daughter. Of the one. Let's do this. Let's do this work. Thank you.